What does it mean to be human? Posed with this question during my first day of English class last year, I could only begin to scratch the surface of all that the broad topic of humanity encompasses. Of course, I started by typing the question into Google, and in turn, I received an abundance of abstract philosophy. As the school year went on, and the content of my different classes began to intersect, I learned it is possible to approach the question from a ver variety of directions. In my science classes, I learned what it means to be human on a physical and biological level through the many ways in which we differ from other life forms. In history classes, I've studied the social and technological developments that have characterized evolving civilizations throughout time. I've discussed communication and culture in countries all around the world, and I've analyzed the art, literature, and creations of individuals with unique backgrounds and stories to tell. And although the knowledge I've absorbed in all of these areas has been fascinating, the question of what does it mean to be human has still remained in the back of my mind ever since, longing for closure, but never quite successful in its quest for an answer. I found that this question is a difficult one, not because it doesn't have an answer, but rather because there's a seemingly infinite number of ways to answer it, depending on where you look and who you ask. I signed up to give this speech back in the fall after knowing since my freshman year that this was the way I wanted to end my time at Brooks. More recently, I decided I wanted to talk about the ways that I've come to approach this very question by sharing a couple of personal anecdotes with the hope that some of you will go on to do the same in your unique ways. My answer to the question began to take shape once I realized humanity in its purest form was on dis full display much closer than I thought, right here at Brooks School. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the ginkgo tree that stands in the center of our campus. The leaves from this tree fall down one day each autumn, and as the old tradition has it, if you catch a leaf before it hits the ground, you'll receive good luck. On that particular day this past fall, I got out of class early and was beginning to walk down Main Street back to my dorm when I noticed the new freshman boy who was walking by himself just ahead of me had suddenly started running towards the, the ginkgo tree. I watched as he began his attempt to catch a falling leaf, darting around the tree and gasp, grasping at the air above him, never appearing to become discouraged throughout his many failed attempts. I finally saw his face light up with joy as one of the fan-shaped leaves floated right down into his grasp. That fleeting moment stuck with me, and as I walked past the tree again that day, I realized that the way in which you try to catch a ginkgo leaf is almost like a window into your humanity. I started to pay attention to the different ways people went about trying to catch a leaf. Some people went up to the tree in a huddle of friends. Some looked on from afar as other people caught their leaves and others didn't even seem to notice the tree was there. That freshman stuck out to me because he didn't care if anyone was watching in his pursuit of his leaf. While others might have been too proud to show weakness or admit that they could use a little luck, he was confident enough in himself that he could truly care be carefree without needing an ounce of validation. This is an important lesson that I didn't realize I needed to be reminded of until that very moment. That small, wordless interaction made my entire day, and I walked away from the tree grateful for the meaningful life lesson that a freshman had just taught me from afar. Finding significance in little moments like these is special on its own, but an equally important aspect of humanity is the power we have to touch others with the meaning that we discover. Every spring, my middle school hosted a declamation competition where each student would choose a poem to memorize and recite in front of their class starting in the fourth grade. I vividly remember visiting my grandparents' house just after my teacher announced we needed to start selecting our poems. As soon as I asked my Nana if she had any ideas, she knew exactly which poem I should use. As she began to recite it perfectly from memory, I could immediately tell how excited she was to share it with me. The poem is called Don't Quit, which Anya just read for you all. Um, Nana learned this poem when she was in the second grade after a teacher had shared it with her. It immediately resonated and has stuck with her throughout her entire life. I ended up using that poem for declamation that year, but the importance it held did not end there. What began as the lighthearted tradition Nana and I had of reciting the poem together hand in hand during family events quickly became more significant as the years started to pass and we both got older. Though Nana's memory slowly began to slip away, this poem has always remained crystal clear in her mind. Every time she recites it, it's like she turns back into her second grade self, regaining pure childlike joy. A huge smile brightens up her face and it brings so much happiness to our entire family time and time again. 
I quickly realized the deeper role this little poem was playing in our lives, as it provided grounding consistency for both of us. Recently, my Nana took a fall and had to have a sudden surgery. The days following her fall were full of worry and anxiety for my entire family, but we were all finally able to exhale the moment that a video came in of Nana in the hospital, hardly two days out of surgery, reciting none other than don't quit with a huge smile on her face, as if each word was pumping strength and resilience back into her. I'm thinking of her this morning just as I have every time I've heard the poem in the year since I first learned it. Those same words continue to fill me with an overwhelming sense of peace and comfort, and I'm so thankful that Nana was able to share them with me, as they've come to represent an important lesson about humanity in my mind. So, what does it mean to be human? My exploration of humanity has not yet led me to a simple, satisfying answer that I can tell you, and I can confidently say that it truly means something different to everyone. However, I've come to realize that the beauty of humanity lies within that exact sentiment. Human beings have the ability to ask this very question and to seek out meaning in the unique experiences that make up the fabric of their lives. I've started to think of each person's humanity as an unfinished puzzle. The pieces of the puzzle are reflections of all the people, places, and experiences throughout life that have left lasting impressions, creating a unique mosaic of all the good, the bad, and everything in between. Your humanity is a collage of everything that makes you, you. For my place in this world, I think to be human is to be vulnerable and to push yourself to be comfortable with the uncomfortable. It is the act of discovering something meaningful and special that brings you peace during hard times and sharing it with the souls around you. Human beings have the capability to think, to live, to feel, to love, to grow, to learn from, a, from one another, and with any luck, to make each other smile. Our humanity makes us each unique, but unites us at the same time. And you can never anticipate the imprints your existence is going to leave on the lives of the people around you. I like to think of myself as a care careful collector of these puzzle pieces, absorbing all of life's little wonders, looking at the world through as many lenses as I can find and listening closely to all of the beautiful stories that others have to share. I almost made it this far without talking about Taylor Swift, but I couldn't. <laughs> But I couldn't talk about my own puzzle without mentioning the immense comfort I found from her perspective on defining your life through all the things you love. She said, in life, we grow, we grow up and we encounter the nuanced complexities of trying to figure out who to be, how to act, or how to be happy. May you take notice of the things in your life that are nice and make you feel safe and maybe even find wonderment in them. May you write down your feelings and reflect on them years later only to learn that all the trials and tribu tribulations you thought might kill you, didn't. Whether it's a single leaf floating from the sky on a random high school afternoon, or the poem that's remained in the back of your mind for decades, everyone has their own collection of little sparks of joy that illuminate life, even if just for a moment. And the magic of being human is that we get to share it all with others. The next Ginkgo Day will be here before we know it. And although I won't be under the tree on the Brooks School campus, I'll still be collecting the pieces that make up my forever evolving puzzle on a brand new campus with brand new people, sharing my pieces of each of you with all of them. I'd still be singing along to my favorite Taylor Swift songs, overthinking questions from last year's English class, calling Nana to recite Don't Quit, and hopefully discovering the poems that I'll someday share with, my gr with grandchildren of my own. So here's a little piece of me to take with you so that next year when the ginkgo leaves fall once again, you think about the mosaics that we're all made of, you hear echoes of my Nana's poem, and you remember my story of what it means to be human. Thank you.